Hi guys, welcome back to Hear Our Voices, where we tell stories, give resources, and change the narrative of homelessness. So right now we are in our hot topic for this month of May 2024, and we actually have something from New Destiny this month, actually. Our guest today is Gabby, and I want you to want her to tell us a little bit more about her project. But before we get into that, you know, we have a lot of people with DV. If you don't know DV is domestic violence, right? In case this is the first time you're listening to this you know, I want you to understand what it really is and how it can affect people and what it looks like. Because for every family, every person, it happens to man or woman. Because people, uh, most cases are reported as women get being the victim of it. But a lot of times men are, and just not reporting it. We want to make sure you can, are clear on what it is and how you can get help before we even get into the topic we're here today. So Gabby, could you please explain what DV actually is? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Kadisha. So hi, everyone. I'm Gabby. I'm the Director of Policy and Communications at New Destiny. Um, and uh, New Destiny is an organization based here in New York City that really focuses only on permanent housing solutions for domestic violence survivors. Um, so yeah, so what is domestic violence? I think, um, you know, the, the best way to put it is a pattern of behavior where power and control are used over a person to manipulate them to you know to to make them do things that they're not comfortable doing and that could be a wide range of things usually we may think of domestic violence as something purely physical uh, but it's more than that. It could be emotional. It could be psychological. It could be financial. It could be a combination of everything. Right. And it doesn't always is between um, like a spouse, you know, like a husband and wife. It could also be between mother and child or, you know, the, the children towards the mother or the father. So it's a combination of things, you know, that that happens within a home structure. Um then, you know, when you hear sometimes intimate partner violence, I know that domestic violence and intimate partner violence sometimes are used interchangeably, but intimate right. partner violence refers to when it is a relationship, like a couple, you know, a romantic relationship. So between two individuals, when one is abusing the other. Right. So I also yeah. want you to think about, it can happen at any age. Your teenagers could be, you know, I think people, parents don't think about my daughter's going out with this guy. Oh my God, going out with this girl. And they don't think about what, what, how this stuff can happen with children. Also, a lot of times teenagers are going through these stuff. They have a lot of emotions. They're growing up, There's a lot of stuff happening and it can happen in these relationships also. So just be aware of those things. I know this is all about family homelessness, but if your child is a part of your family and this is happening to them, it still can be a problem. And a lot of times when people are doing this to others, especially if it's, physical and they see it happen at their home. So something's happening at their home while they even act this way. So just be mindful of that and teach your kids the information. And this could be happening to an older person. You just never know when it could happen. Just look out for it. And if you see somebody going through this problem, definitely speak up. And sometimes you talking to them might not help, but eventually they'll see it and they'll get out of it. Cause it's usually a cycle of coming out of it. Cause it's basically a denial thing a lot of times. And when they do, they'll thank you for it after. But um, make sure they know that you can be a person to call on if you if you can. If you cannot, give them a number for like that's for you know safe horizons things like that who can actually help you with those things because when not everybody's equipped to hear the stories and hear what somebody is doing to their loved one, they might need an outside person to help. So just be aware of things like that, guys. But yes, so we want to get into the project that you're working on and what's the name of the project actually and how does it work. Yeah, so um, there were a couple of things that the mayor announced on May 15th. Um, there were three things, exactly. So one of them is the project, right, that's called Project Home. Uh, this is a pilot program that is being funded by uh, one of a former guest of the show, I think, John Kimball, yes. you spoke with him. So yes. um, John and his organization fund great initiatives around the city. And, and essentially the project is about providing uh, survivors of domestic violence who are in the Department of Homeless Services shelters. So not in domestic violence shelter, but in the big, big, massive system of shelters in the city that's also known as DHS. Um, so they're going to, the city is going to select a hundred families at least to be referred to New Destiny so that they can receive assistance searching an apartment 
with a city FEPS voucher. So um, we are, you know, and it's, it's a pilot program. We're hoping that once um, we are able to house individuals, um, then this is going to be expanded and made permanent and expanded, not just in the sense to go beyond the hundred survivors, but also uh, to other populations, because um, you probably, you know, I've heard folks say in the show that the fact that you get a voucher is the first step and right. many, many, many steps that may take a family or a single adult to get out of, of the shelter system. So, um, you know, having someone as a, that uh, a navigator, a housing navigator that can advocate for the family, for the individual with not just the agency and not just the, the, the client, but also the landlord. I mean, a lot of the bureaucratic uh, issues that happen, happen, um, well, it happened at different levels, different layers, but having someone that is not the tenant or the agency to speak with the landlord and tell them, listen, it's taking a little bit more time for the check to come through. Please hold a unit for the tenant. It is going to happen. And just explaining what the program is really going to deliver and being that person, it, it's essential. It plays a really you know, key role. And also helping you know, voucher holders with the search. You know, it could be overwhelming. New York City is a very expensive place to live. Yes, and housing, is. Yeah, there, there is a lack of, of housing, uh, you know, affordable housing all around. So right. um, I think the latest report showed that it's close to zero, like apartments that are under $2,400. It's like about like mm. less than 1%. So, you know, unless you live in a rent-stabilized apartment or you live in public housing or you live somewhere, it's just really hard to then get be able to get you know that rent so yeah having a voucher obviously it helps but um but being able to find an apartment that is safe that is in an area neighborhood where you know the survivor feels safe where they want to you know build their their home or maybe it's in the school district they want their kids to go to um you know that could be tricky so also this housing navigation program would help survivors to understand their options, you right. know, it's anywhere in the city. Um, they could look, you know, really anywhere. I know sometimes survivors may be a little hesitant to move um, to other places that may have, that are known as, you know, usually referred to as higher opportunity neighborhoods that are, you know, yeah. more wealthier, better school districts. So this is, you know, having someone that can inform them of, of their choices, it's it's really essential in, in their housing journey. So. The program, again, Project Home, is going to help 100 families who are survivors of domestic violence in the Department of Homeless Services shelter access this housing navigation assistance so that they can make use of a city FEPS voucher within New York City. Um, and then we're also, we got funding from someone else to be able to provide aftercare. So once, you know, the family is placed in an apartment, then they have someone they can call in case there are any issues that may come up or in case they need referral to resources, right? We've seen with survivors, a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them do want to be referred to mental health counselors right. uh, or have their kids talk to someone about what happened, uh, talk to financial coaches, you know, because they also want to, you know, build their wealth you know now they, they have a place now what else do they need to deal with now right that's like the right. moment when you get housing it's like all right now I'm, I'm i'm good i have a roof over my head i don't need to worry about you know the shelter people moving me around or right. the mayor changing regulations and shifting me to another shelter who knows now <laughs> exactly. now that i'm here what what else uh, let, let me tackle everything else so so we're going to be able to provide that to to the families as well I think it's a good program. The person who's funding it, actually, you know, I work with them, with John, is the um the the fund for youth and family homelessness. I should remember that. It's so much names to go around, to be honest, but they do a lot of philanthropy work, and we try to make sure we help causes that can help the people of New York City. You know, people who are survivors, they go through a lot. A lot of times when they're going to be moving, they're not going to move where they were before, so they have to go in different communities to make sure their family are safe. So we have to be mindful of those things. And I'm happy that they're picking 100 people, and hopefully it gets bigger and better every year. And I hope that it can help as much families as it can. And I hope that the families do get help for their children, because a lot of times I think we kind of forget about how the child is can see everything and how they 
see, like yeah. we think that ch our child, not that we think our children are dumb, but we think that they don't hear and see what's going on. And they sometimes are just listening and watching and watching what's happening and not, they're just internalizing it because they don't want to say anything because it might affect how mom and dad feel about it too. So um, when you're in this predicament situation, make sure you get your children help. I like that they do aftercare. A lot of times when you get pushed out of shelter, basically, you're like a baby bird. Hopefully you can fly. Hopefully you can make it. But the aftercare part is very important. A lot of families, granted, I didn't go through domestic violence myself, but I know how it is to be out and not know anything. It's my first apartment. I call it a fake apartment because I technically, I'm a, I live in Nigeria. I don't live like in a real big person apartment, but it's still somewhere to live. But it can be very scary. It can be daunting and you don't know what to do, what to, where to go, what, what's this and that. And when you have somebody who you know you can call on to get help for you for aftercare, that's amazing. Another factor about this, what I think is excellent, is that they make the relationship with the landlord. Landlords, I especially if it's bigger landlords, I don't feel that forgiving for them. But the little mom and pop landlords, for sure, who this money, the rent money, helps them go through to pay their mortgage for this place that they live in, and it will fix something that's breaking in the apartment. And if they don't get their money and they're looking for their money, you know, it can be a problem. But they're making sure they foster this relationship with these people. So when this person maybe move out in the future, they could probably put another person in the same spot. And they know that. The money is going to come. And if you don't know, guys, I said this many a times on this this podcast is that the city doesn't pay their money on time. So to have a relationship with an organization like this to kind of help make that connection and, you know, keep this in good standing is a good thing. I think it, it's going to be really amazing for a lot of people. And we're, yes, we're starting with families, but hopefully we can get into individuals when we get funding for those things and see how this works. But I think it's going to work. I, I see success in the future of this program and what New Destiny is doing for the people of New York City, to be honest. Hopefully other people, whoever hear this in the world, can use the same design. Every design is not going to work the same, but you could take what you can hear from here and make it for the people in your community. But yes. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, Kadisha, those are all great points. And I think also, you know, with the glitches of the system, sometimes, you know, people are submitting the information by email, but the email gets lost. Mm. And th th there is like, it, unless you follow up with the agency to confirm like, okay, you got the application, you, you we submitted everything, are we good? Right. Then, you know, things may just fall by the wayside just because no one is keeping an eye on things. So the housing navigator, you know, okay. fills in that gap and additional support. And, you know, our hope as New Destiny is that we can really expand this for every single individual who's struggling. Um, and, and, you know, like the role, for instance, that sh shelters have a housing specialist, you know, right. it, it, it should be this, it should be, you know, the housing navigator, but, you know, for that, we need more capacity. We need more people, exactly. we need training, we need to pay them more to exactly uh, <laughs> combination of things. Right. Um, right. but, but yeah, no, we're really excited that this launched. And, and so that was number one announcement by the mayor. Yeah. Then there were two other announcements that did not get a lot of attention. And I want to make sure that people know about them because okay. they're really game changers. So the first one is that, and these are two long time New Destiny advocacy priorities, um, along with, you know, many other organizations that have been trying to get the same thing. But um, what we got is two things. So for the city to open up what is known as the homeless set aside unit. So right. maybe give you a little bit more context so folks know what I'm talking about. But when the city funds, you know, new buildings for affordable housing right. uh, around the city, if they get um, a certain, like 15% at least, I'm sorry, if they get a certain amount of funding from the city, I, mm -hmm. I believe it's closer to 50% or so, but they get money from the city. The city tells them, all right, that's great. We give you some funding. Now you need to set aside units for individuals and families who are struggling with housing insecurity, who are in, in shelters. Right. And which is great because these are, you know, usually brand new apartments with all the all the toys, you know, like doorman, pool sometimes, you know, yeah, gym, it's but, fancy guys, it's fancy. You know, that's, how's, that's, how's it connect? It takes forever, but some apartments, they look wonderful, I tell you. Yeah, uh, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so what the, the city did though, you know, when this, you know, this was great, game changer. But the city only is was allowing to refer individuals and families in the Department of Homeless Services shelter system. So for those that may not know, there are five shelter systems in New York City. There right. is the domestic violence shelter system. There is the one for youth. There is the other one for individuals who struggle with um, HIV AIDS. That's called the HASA. There is DHS, 
that's also the largest. And then there is another one that's for like case of emergency that, you know, if there is a fire, if there is a building collapses, like it happened in the Bronx uh, not too long mm. ago, you know, those families can go to another type of shelter that's managed by a different agency. Right. Um, it's usually hotels, actually, I should say. They usually yes. pay like the family to go to a hotel, but that's managed by someone else. So all in all, those five different shelter systems, um, not all of them got access to this to this type of uh, housing and right. um the mayor changed it he said well now we're going to give access to domestic violence survivors and domestic violence shelters which are overseen by the human resource administration right. agency That's so awesome. um yeah, I mean, again, you know, we're hoping it it gets expanded because it shouldn't be just two of the five shelters. It should be everyone. It should be, you know, the agency's own shelter system, the housing and preser preservation and development um, shelter system should also have access to these units. So, right. you know, so that was, you know, I, I think great and game changer. And the third announcement has to do with supportive housing. Um, I know you know what supportive housing is, but I don't know if you want me to talk a little bit about what the model is. Of course, entails. people need to know what it is, right? Yes. Yeah. So for people that may not know, supportive housing is permanent, right? Affordable housing that has on-site services and elements. So um, what does that mean? Like you you have, again, usually it's new apartments um, for the most part. Uh, you have your own unit, your own home, you have the keys to your own home, your own lease, usually, and then you have uh, someone in the building, uh, usually in the lower floors, that provides services that can, you know, help you or connect you to other type of, you know, resources that you may need. Right. And, um, you know, it varies on level, because the populations, you know, some sometimes supportive housing may have a nurse on site, if it's for people that have some more medical conditions, et cetera. Um, but that's an all in all, you know, the model. And um, and it's really, you know, for domestic violence survivors, again, you know, because of the trauma and everything that happens, uh, the physical abuse, um, don't know if folks know this, but actually domestic violence survivors can struggle with traumatic brain injury more than football players, but they're rarely diagnosed because they just, you know, they, they don't know about it and then they they almost never get it treated right so um so things like that you know for for issues that arise and, and many others is just great um for for most survivors that need some type of assistance to have access to supportive housing um so what did the mayor say the mayor said uh that support that the city funded supportive housing program that's called New York City 1515. That was an initiative that was launched back in 2016, I believe, um, that committed to create 15,000 units of supportive housing in 15 years in New York City. Um, that's a great program, but domestic violence survivors were not a population that was eligible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, pers like there is, for instance, and like youth would be eligible as a population. Um, families could still apply, but then the head of household has to have a diagnosed disability. And then they have to have spent at least a year in shelter. So, um, so that prevented a lot of domestic violence survivors from being able to get into these, you know, housing units. And the mayor announced that that changed, that now survivors will be a population and they're going to be able to access these units. And what that means is also that uh, nonprofit developers like New Destiny that build supportive housing around the city are going to be able to build with this additional funding. So, and many others too. I know that there are yeah. other domestic violence providers that are, you know, interested, you know, entertaining the idea of, of doing, you know, plus sh having shelter plus uh, supportive housing. And this is going to be a great resource for, for more housing. So, so that's, you know, third announcement. And I don't think that people heard about it that much. Um, <laughs> so just wanted to clarify, it was three things, three great things um, that uh, we're, you know, for on the two announcements, we're still waiting to hear a little bit more about the details of when is it gonna get started? What does it look like um, for the supportive housing change? We really wanna know if, does it mean that like 
they're removing that requirement that I mentioned before of the head of household having to have the diagnosis and a, you know, a stay in shelter that was of one year or more right. for everyone. Like that's known as the chronicity requirement. Right. Are they removing that? Um, like what does it mean? So still waiting on the details, but um, but we're you know obviously we're gonna we're gonna keep monitoring that closely so it happens so that it's not just an announcement and then <laughs> and right. then nothing happens. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely we have an update on that on the podcast. The brain injury situation. Yeah, I know I did a hot topic on that about two or three months ago. I can't tell right now. The time is running together, guys. But we talked about how a lot of people who experience DV do have a lot of high potential of brain injury and not knowing going for years and wondering like, what's going on. Why do I have these headaches? Why am I having blurry vision? And not realizing this is a cause, this is the effect of what's happening to me from before. So they do have a pilot program for that. And if you want to see that, you can go back in the other episodes. Maybe I get my editor to edit the, um, the description down there and add that in for you guys so you know what's going on and how to keep up with these things. A lot of things just intersect with each other, and we're happy that we're getting them help with their minds. We're going to be, be housing them and making sure that we can get all the things that we need, the tools that we need to really make a person a whole person. Because people are just peace. Your, 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 your mind is over here, your body's over here, but we want them to be whole and be able to be a functional part of society. Do you have anything else? Yes. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to add? Um, not about the announcement, but I did want to flag, and I don't know if you maybe you've spoken about this, Kadisha, in other episodes, but the the NYCHA wait list announcement for Section Eight. Yes, that's that's coming up, guys. June third. I'll be doing a separate one because hopefully get to the end of this and it's coming out like next week. But guys, yes, yeah, Section Eight is going to be open after I want to say 14, 15 years. And believe it or not, I applied for it the first time and I lost my application. But it's by, not the point at the moment, but it's opening up in New York City. I'm happy. They said allegedly 200,000 applications. I'm not sure how we're going to fit all these people in New York City. But um, I'm not even, they said, night, it's, some places I see NYCHA and then I said some places I see regular Section 8. So with regular Section 8, you can honestly move anywhere, like live in New York City, stay here for a year and move out if you want to. You could buy also if you don't know with Section 8 a house. But this seems like this one is attached to NYCHA. And if you don't know, regular NYCHA buildings are Section 9. So we'll see how this goes. I feel like they didn't give out, they gave out a little something, but it's just not, I feel like enough. But I, to me, I think apply, I'm going to apply and I live in NYCHA. I'm just saying, I think Section 8 is better than Section 9, to be honest. From what I understand, it might be the, those, they have other, NYCHA owns buildings like regular, as you know, the project building, but they also own other properties. So I think those are the properties they're going to be going for. I don't know how much. They said 200,000. I don't know how they go fit anybody. I just, I don't know. But they said it could do it. I'm all for it. And we know how we saw earlier this year, but technically a little bit last year to this year, how they had city fans go upstate. It might not be that situation that people can't stay in New York City. They might give them a, a pass to kind of, you know, go upstate or something like that. Usually they say if you get it, you got to stay in the area that you're in and then you transfer out over a year. But who knows what they're going to do. I'm happy that they're giving the opportunity to people to make sure they can live where they want to live, be happy, afford it. And honestly, Section 8 has a bigger um, income requirement, like, compared to city fabs. So if you have city fabs, you ha like, I can't qualify for city fabs. When I look up the guidelines for Section 8, I qualify for that. So I'm very excited that I'll be able to do this. If I get it, I do. If I don't get it, I don't get it. It wasn't meant to be. But I hope if you're listening to this, you do it. It's only open for a week, guys. It's really, really open in the third and closing a week later. So if you don't get in, I'm sorry, but please, please apply and make a difference for you and your family or individual. I'm pretty sure they're giving out the individuals too, not just only families. And yeah, it's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, it's, um, I, you know, and maybe I know you're, you're probably going to have more information about this separately, Kadisha, but one thing that I wanted to flag is that um, it's, it's going to be a lottery. So anybody yes. that's eligible can apply within the seven day window from June right. 3rd through June 9th. Uh, but then the city is going to take all those applications of people that are eligible and select randomly 200,000 right. to be added to the wait list. So right. it's it's a long shot, but I think I think that everybody that that is eligible, like yourself and others, you know, they, they should get on that list because it's um, you, you don't know. We don't know if there may be another, you know, emergency housing voucher push exactly. and then there are additional Section 8s made available to the 
to New Yorkers. So right. I feel, you know, if anyone is eligible, um, they, they should definitely get on it. It is a little bit different though. Uh, just one one tiny, you know, detail there that it's not, um, the applications are processed by NYCHA because NYCHA, there are two entities that the federal government works with in New York City to manage right. the Section A program. And right. one is NYCHA and the other one is the Housing Preservation and Development, HPD. So right. you can get, like, it's still federal Section A, but it comes through those agencies. So okay. what they're doing is opening up the NYCHA wait list. Um, but it's still a federal, you know, Section A, like any other voucher that, that people can get. And you can, it, it's portable, so you can take it anywhere. It's not oh. to, it's not housing in a NYCHA development. That's so good it's to like know. A, yeah, so it's like a regular Section 8, like the emergency housing voucher, um, you know, similar to that. Um, and yeah, so again, it's, I think the mayor, it, it sounded like, oh my God, they're going to give more Section 8 vouchers. Um, <laughs> It's the wait list, but I think still is, you know, it's really important for people to get on it. And, and you know, if we see that there are millions of people applying, that speaks volumes about the need for assistance. And right. then we can, as I mean, as an advocate, I'm thinking this already, that we can go and make the case for the housing access voucher program. That's the exactly, state. Exactly. You know where I'm going, right? But the right. state program that we've been trying to get across with New York State that would create a similar, something very similar to Section 8, but in New York State. Right. Um, so if there is demand, then we can we can show like New Yorkers need this, the 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 mayor needs to act, the governor needs to act. So um let's let's get people home, you know. For sure. But guys, thank you again for coming for this one's hot topic for, I'm sorry, I should know the name because you just said it. It's Home. What's the name of the project? Uh, Project Home. Project Home. See, I was you close, guys. I was close. Project Home. I should know that. But yeah, sorry, guys. Thank you for coming to watch and listen to this podcast. I hope that this can help you. I hope that, you know, this. when we give you more information, you're able to help yourself and be more knowledgeable about what's out, actually out there. New York City has so much things happening. Pilots this year, pilots next year, you just never know what's happening. And if you're not informed, you cannot get the help when you need it. So we hope that these kind of topics and that we give you are helpful. Look down below on the link tree. You can get all the information down there for different platforms that we are on and that we drop things almost daily, honestly, depends on where you go. If you go on Instagram, TikTok, or YouTube, we have a lot of information coming out all the time. We, if we think it's something you need now, we put it on there right now so you can get it to be able to help you and your family. But thank you for listening and I hope you have a good day and be safe guys. Bye.